Well, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Hannah, as Lance was saying, and I'm a young adult here at New Hope. And I feel so honoured to share the message with you today. And some of you might have saw, like, I've got my drink bottle down the bottom. So I was screaming a lot last night when <laughs> Collingwood won. So I might need to take a break or two here or there to get a drink if my voice fails me. So, yeah, it was a good game, though. Anyways, back to the message. <laughs> I just want to say a big welcome to everyone here, especially to um, Reese's family and friends. Like, can we just give Reese a round of applause? Like, how good, how good's God? How good was his testimony? Yeah, and just a big welcome to friends and family of Reese and anyone watching online. Um, big thank you for coming, and I hope you guys enjoy the rest of the service. So when I was praying into this message, like before I even talk about what I'm going to talk about, the word freedom came to mind. God wants to set us free. He wants to set you free from the things that are holding you captive. So maybe something to think about while I'm speaking is what is holding you captive today? Maybe words people have spoken over your life. Maybe you feel like you're in bondage to a secret sin that you, that you feel like you have to hide in darkness and shame. Or maybe you're just really, really busy and you feel like you're a slave to work or just going to school day in and day out and it's exhausting and you feel like you don't have any time to breathe. Like, I don't know what you're carrying or your burden is today. But the one thing that I'd love for us to understand is that a relationship with God, and I've experienced this myself, so I'm not just saying this, this is what I've experienced that a relationship with God sets you free and has set me free too. God wants your heart, He wants your mind, He wants your soul and He wants your body to be set free. Now, what I've come to understand in my own journey is that freedom does not mean that your life will be free of sin or of hardship. No, I completely disagree with that. It says in John 16, that in this life we will have trouble, but we can live in freedom because our soul is satisfied in God. Now, what does that even mean? That might sound a bit complicated, um, but I believe that we were created to be in relationship with Jesus, a relationship that will sustain us and complete us, even when people and circumstances and even ourselves let us down. I believe that there's a goal, that there's a God-shaped hole inside of all of us. And as I was saying, as for my experience, it's only when I look to the one who made me that is when I'm satisfied. For me in my journey, freedom in Christ looks like not needing to look for the fulfillment in people and their opinions, which I used to crave and still do from time to time. Like, don't get me wrong, people are great, but they will let you down. But I've come to understand that God won't. And I've had to ask this question a lot in my life, like, God, like, are you enough for me? And I've really come to understand from my experience that he is. And similar to what Reese is talking about as well. God is enough for me. And I believe that he's enough for you too here. Today, friends, be encouraged that God wants to set you free from whatever you're battling. And he's not just some angry figure in the sky who wants you to abide by some rules and for you to do things for him. No, like, I don't think that's what a healthy relationship looks like at all. Friends, know that you have the opportunity to walk in freedom. And that is through walking in relationship with Jesus. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for every single person in this room right now. Thank you that you've handpicked each person to be here, God. Um, I really just pray for, for open hearts today that each person is in here for a reason, God. And yeah, I really just pray that you touch everyone in a, in a unique way, God, whether that's through this sermon, whether that's through the worship, whether that's through what Reese has shared in his testimony, God, I pray that we can walk away feeling a little bit lighter than, than, than we came in, God. So yeah, I thank you that everyone here is loved as Reese has shared, God, and that we can leave here feeling free, God, free, free that you're with us and that you go before us, God. Thank you, and in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I'm going to be reading from Ephesians 6, verse 10 to 18. But before I do, I just want to give a little bit of context. So Ephesians was written by this guy called Paul, and he was writing to the church in 
emphasis or Ephesus. I don't really know how to say it. You can go to the Bible and look it up for yourself if you really want to know how to pronounce it. And Paul was an apostle, which means that he spread the good news of God everywhere he travelled. He talked about Jesus everywhere he went. Interestingly, he was writing Ephesians as a prisoner, which I also think is quite sad, um, in a Roman jail. Um, so he was writing in jail. So I assume he was writing in like a, in, in, in like a letter form. And so that's why, as, as I'll read, we'll hear lots of references in that passage to like the Roman soldier uniform, like shields and swords and all that, because he would have been a, around a lot of Roman soldiers while he was in that prison. Also, the terminology of words we'll hear, like battle and fighting and good and evil, like that mirrors the Romans going out and fighting their enemies at the time, which I think is really interesting. So let's get into it. If I could have Ephesians... Oh, it's already up there. Perfect. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Didn't even need to ask. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Um, so let's get into Ephesians 6, verse 10 to 18. It's on the screen there. I've highlighted some words that are important in my belief to the passage. So yeah, let's go. From verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled to your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which you can extinguish all let me turn the page, sorry. All flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. So I understand that is a lot of information and a lot of interesting concepts up there. So to make it easier for myself and everyone else, I'm going to focus on two key concepts that I believe are vital to understanding this passage. And for any note takers, this would be the time you can write these down. <laughs> so number one, we need to identify the spiritual warfare or battle that is going on in our own lives. And number two, we need to understand who our enemy is if we are going to have any success in fighting against him. So I think the best, the best metaphor I have for spiritual warfare is like that of an international cyber attack. I can just see all the blank looks. I will explain. <laughs> what happens here is that a foreign power thousands of kilometres away can hack into a government's computer network and ultimately bring that country to its knees. This cyber attack has the potential to wreak havoc on government and civilian infrastructure and disrupt critical systems, resulting in a lot of damage that can take years to recover from or it can even result in the loss of life. But see, the thing about a cyber attack is that it is conducted in a way that is relatively unseen to people like you and like I. And in a similar way, that's what I believe spiritual warfare is. It's not always a physical battle that you can tangibly point to. It's an unseen struggle for the hearts and the minds of human souls. And it's going on right now, all around us. Spiritual warfare is, if I could sum it up in a cute little sentence, <laughs> are principalities and powers that take our focus away from God, away from our relationship with Him and the purposes that He has for our lives. What this looks like for myself is a battle between choosing to please myself, to make my life about me, or to glorify God. So, what can spiritual warfare look like in our lives? What are the things that distract us from the call of God or get in the way of you and I becoming more like Jesus? 
from what I've researched and from what I can see, I really believe that it all comes back to the temptation of defying God's plans for our lives and trying to define good and evil for ourselves. From the beginning, the Christian belief is that us humans have been influenced by outside forces of evil who have their own wills and intentions. As shown in Genesis 1 and 2, God made Adam and Eve and He called them, but He also calls us very good. It says that He made us in His likeness, in His image. And so as image bearers of God, we were to be in perfect relationship with Him. And together, humans were to partner with God in looking after each other and the world. However, as we read in Genesis 3, we chose to rebel and it was our choice. God is a loving God and He gave us free will and we chose to go against His will. We were tempted by a serpent who we believe is the enemy and we who claimed that humans could be like God. That we could go off and do our own thing and define good and evil for ourselves. That we could live a life outside of God's design and it would be great and it would be amazing. And so we did that. And basically sin entered the world for the first time. You might have heard of the word sin before. It's basically a bit of a Christianese word that literally means to miss the mark. Sin means to miss the mark. It is to go against God's very good will and intentions for our lives. And now we're here. We're here and we're living in a hurting and confused world that is searching for God, but in all the wrong places. This is the ever-present battle. As we've mentioned earlier, not a a battle of flesh and blood, but a battle of principalities and powers, where we have a God who loves us, who wants relationship with us, who wants to free us, and He's calling us alive for Him. Yet we live in a world that has rebelled, that has rejected God, and is trying to define good and evil for themselves. This is the tension that we live in. This is what spiritual warfare looks like. And following on from this, spiritual warfare often presents itself in our temptation to sin and go outside of God's best for our lives. As I've mentioned earlier, sin is defined as missing the mark and going outside of God's design. In Ephesians 4 verse 27, we are reminded not to give the devil a foothold because the moment we allow sin to enter our lives, we open ourselves up to attack for our enemy because we are stepping out of the protective barriers that God has put in place for our own good. James 1 verse 14 says, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their evil desire and enticed. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin when it is full grown gives birth to death. And see, this is the irony of sin. Like, take it from me. Like, it can seem so alluring. Like, sin seems to offer that instant gratification or that quick fix. But like, let's be honest, after you do it, after you think it, it always leaves you feeling so empty. And this is a really great quote about sin I've heard other pastors use. um, And I just want to share it because I think it's like incredible. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay and it will cost you more than you want to pay. I'm just going to read that again. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay and it will cost you more than you want to pay. Gossip will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, cost you more than you want to pay. Porn or lust will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay and will cost you so much more than you want to pay. Unforgiveness or hurts that you haven't dealt with will take you so much further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay and will cost you so much more than you want to pay. Jesus even says in John 8 that everyone who sins becomes a slave to it. And I'm not saying this to shame you, like we all struggle with some form of sin and we are tempted daily to disregard God's best for our lives. I just want us to be aware that this is an attack 
This is a tactic the enemy uses to make sin look so appealing and so freeing that we, that we do it once and then we do it again and then we go back to it again and again and again and again, that we're not actually living free because we're not going to God for our fulfillment or our fulfillment. This is the tension we face. This is what spiritual warfare can look like. Another example of spiritual warfare that we face is blindly believing and buying into the lie that your life is your own and your desires and needs should come first. Spiritual warfare, as I've previously mentioned, is often disguised in our lives like a cyber attack. Like clicking on a dangerous online link, the small steps we can take without being thoughtful and discerning can be really dangerous. In our society today, there's this idea of like following your heart, where we'll find wholeness and completeness in making life about me, in making Hannah the main character of everything, in almost putting yourself on a pedestal, in doing whatever will make Hannah happy. The temptation that society often brings is that sex, love, and a whole lot of money will complete you. But as we read in Ecclesiastes, which was written by King Solomon, who by the way, was rich, was famous, he was like a celebrity back in the day. He had many wives and women and relationships and he's basically saying, guys, I've experienced and I've done everything under the sun, yet it's all meaningless and does not fulfill the God-shaped hole in our lives. Nothing can fulfill a person apart from a relationship with God. So this is what he says in Ecclesiastes 2, verse 10 to 11. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labour and this was the reward for my toil. Yet when I surveyed, all that my hands had done and what I had taught to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. The enemy will try to use these temptations, things that look appealing, things that look fulfilling to distract you from God and the purposes for your life. So we've talked a bit about the nature of spiritual warfare and what that could look like for us today. I've mentioned a few concepts like our own sin and the temptation to make life about ourselves and following our own desires. But obviously there's so much more we could talk about. But I just wanna talk about something else now. I wanna discuss who is our enemy? Who are we fighting against in this spiritual war? What does it mean in Ephesians 6, 11 when it talks about the devil and his schemes? Like that's a bit interesting. In the Bible, the devil has a few names. I've been referring to him as the enemy. He's also called Lucifer or Satan. Interestingly, Satan in Hebrew means the accuser or the liar. Sometimes he's also referred to as the God or the prince or the ruler of this world or phrases like that. For example, in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4, it says, the God of this age, Satan has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So he deceives the world of the truth, which I find really ironic because often when we think of like the devil or Satan or Lucifer, we think of this like really weird out there kind of funny red cartoon character with a pitchfork. But apparently, this is not who we're up against. Ephesians 6 informs us that we're up against a very informed, a very well organised, a very schemic demonic opposition whose goal is to deceive, to manipulate, to encourage humans to wage war against each other and against God. Like, how often do we get so caught up in blaming each other and holding things against each other? Like, Just go outside, there's such disunity in the world and let's be honest, in the church as well. How often do we forget that people aren't the problem? We're not fighting against flesh and blood, we are fighting against the enemy and his demonic opposition. So, what is Satan's goal? And I think this is one of the most important parts of this sermon. What, like, our enemy, what is his goal? 
The enemy's number one goal is to stop people from believing in God because he hates God. And he knows Jesus Christ sets people free and he doesn't want people to live in freedom. The enemy would love for people to misinterpret God's character, to believe that Christianity is just a bunch of outdated rules and that God either doesn't care or that he's disappointed in you. And why would anyone want to believe or love a God like that? And if the enemy can't get you to deny there's a God, he'll go to plan B. He'll try to make Christians so complacent and distracted with life that they won't be living out their purpose. Like the enemy wants nothing more for us who believe in God to become self-reliant, to idolise people or the other end of the spectrum, to just hate people in general, to find identity in our own achievements, to spend way too much time on our phones, I'm convicted too, scrolling on social media so that we're not actually aware, we're not actually present or even listening to God's voice and spending time with Him. So if we're not relying on God, then we're not living out our purpose. We're not fighting the good fight, which Jesus makes clear in Matthew 28. Jesus says that we are to go out into the world that is craving fulfilment and hope in all the wrong places. And little teaching lesson, I'm not a teacher, but go is a verb, which is a doing word. We are to go out into the world. We are to let our life be proof of God's love for all people. Like what I know to be true to me is that no one cares what you know unless they know that you actually care. Like, it's so simple. It can be challenging at times to do, but the concept is really simple. Journey alongside people, be a good friend, go out of your way for people, live a life that reflects Jesus and His character. And if you get the opportunity, share your testimony, like what Reese has done today, and share the good news of Jesus. And bro, just like, don't be weird about it. Like, don't force it on people, but if you get the opportunity and you feel prompted, share what God has done in your life and that a relationship with Jesus offers freedom and fulfilment like nothing else. Because everyone's searching for it. Like, go outside in here. Everyone's searching for that sense of fulfilment. And this is what we're called to do. And the enemy will do everything he can to stop the good news from being spread. And it starts with him tempting Christians to be complacent and distracted from this mission. Like it actually doesn't matter what happens in here if it doesn't impact you enough to go out into the world and love others like Jesus did. And this, like this is the battle we face today. And I wanna reassure us that we're not fighting from victory, we're fo- sorry, I want to assure us that we are fighting from victory, not for victory. So it's not like a Star Wars kind of vibe where it's like good and evil and evil's in front like 95% of the time and then Luke Skywalker like brings out his lightsaber or whatever and then good wins. It's not like that. Like <laughs> Jesus took our place on the cross and died for our sins so that we can live as new people, as new creations that aren't bound or defined by our by our mistakes anymore. Like we can live in freedom. We are fighting from victory, not for victory. I said it right that time. (laughs) And we are called to stand, as I've highlighted in the verse before, we are called to stand and live out of that victory and share that with the people in our lives. Like stand is mentioned something like four times in Ephesians 6, like the verse that I read out. And that's, I think that's really, really important. And God has, God has already given us the armour we need to protect ourselves and stand up against the enemy. So I just want to encourage us with a little analogy that I think best sums up how we can navigate and just thrive through this spiritual battle. So when I get into my car and I don't know where to go, I always, without fail, because I don't trust myself because I've got a terrible sense of direction, I turn on my Google Maps. I go to my GPS because I trust that even when I don't know where to go or I literally, because I'm in my car, obviously I've parked, I'm not driving with, you know, my phone in my hand because that'd be legal. So I park. If I literally don't know where to turn, the GPS will know. (laughs) There we go. Um, So GPS is my analogy. G stands for go to God. P 
P stands for pray through the scriptures and S stands for seek wise counsel. So let me unpack that a little bit. Go to God. When we've trusted in Jesus' death and resurrection for the forgiveness of our sins, we were given the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives us direct access to God. So I encourage us to, to turn to God, to go to God, and He will direct you through the battles and oppositions you face. And I really like what Reese was saying before that it may not be like, God, what do I do? And God will just tell you. Like, I think, you know, sometimes that might happen. Like, it's different for everyone. But I really see the benefit of like continuing to press in, to continue to go to God. It might not happen straight away, but He will give you an answer whether you like it or not. Pray through the Scriptures. Why should we read the Bible? And I just want to preface, it's not about ticking a box. One of the many reasons is that we get to read the desires of and wisdom from God Himself. When we're reading the Bible, pray and ask God to reveal truth to you. And this is really similar to how Paul explains the sort of the Spirit. And Paul is saying that a child of God needs to have an in-depth understanding of the Word of God so that in the hour of conflict, so that when you're tempted to sin, so that when things happen that, that are out of your control, we can speak the truth from the Word to the enemies and lies and temptations. And I'm going to just say, like, for me, I don't love or I wouldn't naturally go to reading the Bible. But the more I understand God's truth, it's true. The more you can speak to those lies, the more you can speak to those temptations from God's Word. And finally, S, seek wise counsel. Proverbs 11:14 says that wisdom comes from the counsel of many. And I just want to encourage us to surround ourselves in Christian community who can be praying on your behalf, who can help you become more like Jesus. And just like, you know, this is a great community, incredible friends, you know, who wouldn't want this? Um, Because we're not facing this battle alone. Like something I found out is that each soldier is running onto the battlefield, would be protected by heaps of shields, which would be held up by other soldiers. So you're running out together. Other people are protecting you. So when you're struggling, maybe with a secret sin or decision or just like anything in life, go to your community, go confess, go seek advice from the Christian brothers and sisters in your life. And I also believe that God speaks through and works through people. As I said before, you don't stand alone and God does not want you to stand alone. I believe that we're all made in God's image. And I believe in the beginning before God made humans, there was, there was the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. He is community. So we all have an innate desire in us to, to have relationship. It's just part of our DNA. And from personal experience, you're just not going to thrive in life without a solid Christian community in your life. And I just want to encourage us today, if you feel like you don't have a solid group of Christian friends, like after the service, please chat to me, chat to Lance, Adam, Hannah, Reese, like, and just everyone around you. Like there's so many people here that, that want to chat to you and want to get to know you. Like know that you're so loved in this place. If I could invite the band up, that would be incredible. So I just think it's so important that we turn to our GPS every day to go to God, to get into the Word, to spend time with God, whatever that looks like for you, and to be in community and to be a good friend to other people. As this spiritual battle and the enemy who just wants to separate, to separate us from God won't stop until we meet Jesus one day. However, as I've mentioned earlier, God, through sending His Son down to die for our sins and defeat death, has won us the victory and we are fighting from Victory, not for victory. And most importantly, know that a relationship with Jesus brings freedom. The freedom in Christ I've experienced is so much greater and more fulfilling than the allure of sin or the temptation of making life about me. So I encourage you to come back to Him today. We're going to move into a time of worship now. And I don't know where you're at with your faith. I don't know the things that you're carrying. I don't know your past. I don't know what's going on right now, but I just want to encourage you to invite God into your heart by praying, which is just talking to God, by asking Him to fill and to free you in this time of worship. 
Or maybe you've been facing some spiritual attacks or spiritual warfare. And I just encourage you to lay it all out, to apologise to God for what you may have done wrong and you will receive forgiveness. And just again, ask Him to set you free and to walk with you in these hard times. I just encourage us to position ourselves to hear from God tonight. Whether that is like going on, on, going on your knees, whether that is raising hands, whether you feel prompted to pray for someone, like position yourself to hear from God tonight. Friends, you have the opportunity to walk in freedom and that is through walking in relationship with Jesus.